Crank up the volume and get ready for real-world bird hunting by listening to the Wingman Podcast by Eastman's. Now your host, Todd Helms. This episode of the Wingman Podcast is brought to you by Savage. Guys, I love my Savage Renegade. You know, a couple years ago when we first partnered with Savage, I didn't quite know what to think of the Renegade. I hadn't been able to get my hands on one yet. I love the Savage line of rifles, obviously, but the new Savage Renegade didn't take very long to win me over. And I have to say, I've put thousands of rounds through a couple different guns now, and they do nothing but go bang and kill birds, which is what I need in a shotgun. I love the fact they're tough as nails. They're super reliable. I could change the fit if I need to. So the Savage Renegade, man, that's a winner. Knocked it out of the park. Thank you, Savage. Hey, guys. Welcome to another episode of the Wingman Podcast. And on as my guest today is the one and only Sam Soholt. Sam, after we got our technological difficulties lined out on my end, I might add, because you're dialed. How you doing, man? I'm doing good. Yeah, I'm doing great. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Well, I got to say, this is the first time you and I've had a chance to actually talk. Um, I know we've kind of got a connected history through Eastman's and some great stories about you floating around this office. <laughs> I tell you what, there's some there's some stuff that I just we're going to bring up and talk about. But uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule and jumping on the podcast. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate all that you're doing for conservation and everything that you're doing with Ducks Unlimited and all the stuff that you've got going on out there, man. You're just an awesome voice and representative for the hunting community. Well, hey, just thanks for having me on. And, you know, it's easy to, easy to make time for something like this because the, uh, the more I can spread the message and we can spread the message through public land tees and stuff, the, you know, just the bigger this all gets. So I'll, uh, I'll always make time to be able to hop on and, and uh, kind of spread the conservation word i guess but <laughs> no i that's great i i agree i agree i don't think that uh i don't think we we take that into consideration enough sometimes it's like we can do all the stuff we want on social media and different platforms but this kind of stuff is really important as well and people just want to hear it and they and they want to hear those messages i had an opportunity to record podcast with ed arnett from the wildlife society last week well, a week before because he's in croatia now or was he might be home and man we dove into some we went down the rabbit hole on some stuff and things that just don't get talked about very much and um the feedback on that podcast on the episode was really positive people were like man this is the kind of stuff we want to hear more and more of so again i appreciate the time yeah absolutely cool no it's it's you know it's interesting um the the conservation thing is two parts right um and and what we've found in the past is you almost have to do like if you want to actually move the needle and raise some money and like get some things done you almost have to do two campaigns the first campaign is education and so you're giving people a very high level view of like what conservation funding actually is and like how where the money flows from and to and how that money is put to use and then you can start to talk to people about like raise, you know, collectively raising money um, because it's no, it's, it is not an easy task to get people to donate just for the sake of donation. If there's not a guaranteed, you know, incentive on the other end, other than knowing that 10, 15, 20, hundred years from now, there's still going to be ducks on the flyway. So, <laughs> um, yes, yes. Yeah. Yep. Well, you, and you just wrapped up something last week was the duck ruck yes the what, <laughs> it was the yeah tell us about that man what did that entail and give people a lowdown what was that all about for sure so uh, we have a project we do every year started in 2019 and we call it the stamp it forward project and it's a way for um basically what we you know it's funny when we started it i literally just hopped online and was like uh we went out I, I took $2,500 cash out of the account and I drove around to different post offices and I bought a hundred duck stamps and kind of documented that and showed that. And then basically put out a goal, like send us your money. Let's see how many we can buy. And I literally that first year, like it was my Venmo, like people were just Venmoing money or PayPaling money. And then like with a hundred percent of the money we received, we went out and we bought more duck stamps. So in year one, we had enough companies and people get involved that we uh raised 25 grand and bought a thousand duck stamps in 2019 
That's awesome. Yeah. So then we were a little more organized in 2020. We had uh, ended up buying just shy of 1,600 duck stamps. Uh, 2021, we did like 1,200 duck stamps. And then 2022, rather than just having it open ended, we like, we're like, all right, we have a goal. We're going to try to buy 2,000 duck stamps and raise 50 grand this fall. And so we did. We, you know, it took us all fall to make it happen, but we um, got the money together through companies and individuals donating and raised fifty thousand dollars, bought two thousand duck stamps, and then this year uh, we typically try to swing for the fences, and so kind of put a twist on the Stamp It Forward project. And it's still ongoing. We're still taking donations. We're still going to continue to raise money, but the the big push of it was this idea to do a hundred mile duck ruck. And so planned a route through the middle of the prairie pothole region, actually hiked, started in North Dakota and migrated south into South Dakota and um, did it in three days. So hiked 100 miles over three days, 33.33 uh, .33 miles a day. Dang, and dude. yeah, yep. And, uh, you know, we're a, a few days removed now. So my my feet don't look my right foot doesn't look like it went through a shredder. Oh, and, man. <laughs> But, uh, but no, it was good, you know, like, it, so right now, you know, as of a few minutes ago, um, online donations are at, uh, 45,670 or some, somewhere right in there. Yeah. So we're, you know, well under the goal this year was to raise a hundred K and obviously we, there's, a, you know, a lot of room there, but the yeah. fact that this, or, you know, it's mid September and we're already sitting at almost 50 K is absolutely has blown us away as far as the involvement in individuals willingness to donate and companies willing to jump on board again and uh you know we had a whole pile of companies give us stuff to do a giveaway we're actually going to do the it's wednesday night the 20th so we're gonna draw all the names tonight and give away the rest of the gear um so you know we tried to really blow it up this year and so far it's gone gone really well dude good for you that's that is phenomenal. This that kind. I remember the first time I saw, and it was 2019, the Stamp It Forward project. My first thought, because I'm old, because I'm I'm old, and I you know back in the day you couldn't buy a duck stamp online. Right. You had to go to your post office, and I'm like, dude, what are you doing off buying up all the duck stamps? <laughs> so no, I can't get a duck stamp. You know, explain that to guys, because now you can get your duck stamp online, and that's what I usually do any anymore. Anyway, there's still something to be said about going to a post office and getting that physical stamp though i still love having one and i usually buy two yeah buy my one online so i've got it in like my phone you know yep. not just a picture of it right and then i go buy the physical stamp because i collect them too but how does it work what is what does that money go to what what's the idea yeah so uh you're not the only one who uh, gave us crap for uh buying up all the duck stamps that first year so like i had to go to like seven post offices to find a hundred and had a lot of people mad so we did a lot of educating that year one um you can actually go on and buy an e-stamp now uh anywhere anytime hop online buy an e-stamp and that well i'll talk about this after but at current time that e-stamp is good for 45 days and then they still mail you a physical stamp so it's not like you're not going to get a, a physical stamp so we had to tell a lot of people that no we're not taking away opportunity like this is you know you can still go duck hunting you know and the, like when i was doing this at the, at the time in 2019 it was like early october so season had been open for two weeks it's not like you know anyway that's a whole other story right so the, co the the whole concept though behind the duck stamp itself is it is the most efficient way to get money to the ground and what i mean by that is by law 98 percent of the purchase price of a duck stamp has to be spent on wetland ac acquisition so it, and a lot of that money does get funneled to the prairie pothole region but that's because it is the duck factory and so a lot of the money goes here uh you know basically duck prairie pothole region starts in northwest iowa and runs all the way up into canada so it's not it's not this like you know it's not just north and south dakota the money is going to Iowa, North Dakota, South Dakota, into Canada. I guess they're not the U.S. money, but they have their own stamp, you know. And and a lot. The reason is because the prairie, the duck factory uh, creates it's like sixty to sixty five percent of all of the ducks that go to any flyway. So whether they're born here, they might end up on the you know Atlantic Flyway or Pacific mm -hmm. Flyway or whatever. So, but it's a lot of the money gets put here, and even above and beyond that, it is creating public access. So it's purchasing small parcels of grasslands uplands wetlands that are turned into waterfowl production areas which are open to public hunting so it's good for migratory bird species 
it's good for everything else that relies on wetlands and grasslands and uplands and and then it's also good for uh, the hunting community because it kind of spreads people out. It, it, it creates more areas for people to go enjoy the activity we all love to do. So it's a very easy way for people to get involved in conservation. You don't have to be a member of something. You don't have to have a hunting license to buy one. You don't have to, you know, there's no hoops to jump through. You can literally go buy a duck stamp and know that 98% of that $25 is being spent on more ground. That's so cool. Yeah. And that goes back into something that, that, uh ed and i were talking about in the last episode was he makes well he doesn't make not a requirement for an a but he's an interim professor as, as well teaching wildlife biology courses and he recommends that his non-hunting students which you can imagine he probably he doesn't have a, a lot of them a lot of students that actually hunt he's like you know one of the best things you can do for wildlife especially waterfowl go buy a federal duck stamp mm -hmm. It's one of the best things you can do because that money goes directly to what you just explained. So I think it's cool, man. And have people like learned, has your education worked? Are people still getting upset with you? No, nobody's getting mad anymore. You know, there's a few people that uh, get mad at us because they, you know, like obviously what we do with the stamps afterwards is a way to turn one fundraiser into another. So we, right. we buy all the stamps and then we start giving them I mean, as, as, I mean, as, as whenever this podcast come out, we'll already be doing it. But uh, we give away a stamp with every single item we sell on the website, but five bucks from everything we sell on the website, we give back to conservation organizations. So um, we do that. And then we're um, obviously, if we can hit a, get to our higher goal, we're going to donate a bunch of stamps to Ducks Unlimited and Delta Waterfowl. And then we're giving a bunch of stamps away to youth, new hunter and veteran organizations to get people outside. Um, so the, the amount of crap that we get from people is way less than it was that first initial push. Um, but there's, you know, I figure the, the more crap we get that we must be doing something right for making the pe yeah, people yeah. mad. Yeah. <laughs> what, what's the old saying? There's no such thing as bad press. That's you right. Know? Yeah. It's that's one of those, right. but that it's so cool, you know, and, and you, and you made a good point there a minute ago when you said, yeah, this money's going back into conservation. It's going into habitat production areas. It's going into all this stuff and it's going to Delta and Ducks Unlimited. But there's one thing that you mentioned and it was recruitment. It was hunter recruitment. Because without that piece of the puzzle in place, we can conserve all the habitat we want. And to what end, you know, other than the noble end of just keeping waterfowl in, you know, in the general trust, the public trust. But the more it, when you light that fire on an, on a, under a new hunter and then they're buying duck stamps and then they're buying t-shirts and they're buying gear and guns and shit all that stuff that goes in into the fold man it's just we have to continue to do that so that's super cool hey guys todd helms with wingmen by eastman's and i want to talk to you about juniper mountain coffee you know i've drank a lot of coffee in my day and this stuff is the highest quality coffee that i've ever had juniper mountain coffee is a direct from the grower to you with no middleman, family owned and oriented company. I love how our values align. And right now you can get 25% off by using the code Eastman's, E-A-S-T-M-A-N-S. -S. I'd highly recommend the sampler pack. So go to Juniper Mountain Coffee and use the code Eastman's to get your best coffee ever. It's been a very fun project. And I think one of the coolest things that we've had happen over the years is you know, let's say, you know, let's say we've raised 25, 40 grand, whatever, you know, to go by and we have this big stack of duck stamps. So then somebody goes on our website and they buy six, seven items, you know, um, well, then they get a whole pile of stamps. Well, what's happening is a lot of times, sure, they might be giving it to a buddy. They might be, you know, doing whatever, but a lot of times they're like gifting it to an uncle that used to duck hunt and hasn't done it in years, you know? So we get, I get a message or we get a message from people like, Hey, I bought three shirts from you guys. I wasn't expecting to get three stamps, but I gave one to my uncle John who hasn't duck hunted in 15 years. And because of it, he came back out and duck hunted with us this fall, you know? Oh, cool. And we had, we had another, you know, like one guy was like, I've got elderly neighbors and they bird watch a ton and like, you know, go to the refuge and do this. And so I went over, I gave him a duck stamp, explained kind of how it all works. And then now they're buying a duck stamp every year. So, you know, obviously we can only track the amount of stamps that we buy. But I tell you what, man, the number of 
posts we get tagged in where somebody went to the post office before season and bought five, six, 10, whatever, and they're giving them out. You know, now we're seeing other companies uh, basically take our model and use it to buy more duck stamps and then sell more gear. So like last year, Sheen waiters, they were giving away a duck stamp with every pair of waiters they sold. This year, GNH decoys is giving away a duck stamp with every level, like a certain level of a dozen decoys or whatever. So it's, it's, you know, it, I, I have no idea. We have no idea the total impact we've had on the number sold. Um, but we're pretty proud of like, there's been enough noise around it where other people are trying to do it and more people are buying more and it's just uh yeah it's an easy way to know that all that money's yeah. going back that's so cool and companies like shed you know that you just that you just mentioned uh had an opportunity to have them on the podcast a few weeks ago too and just a just a whole ethos behind conservation and hunter recruitment everything involved it's it's fun to work with and be and be partnered with companies like that that are forward thinking and just, just into it, you know, it bought up, bought in. I, I love it. There was a, and you're, you're aware of this, but maybe not the whole audience. There was, we had obviously horrific winters out here last year, Montana, Idaho, Northern Colorado and Wyoming. And the, the reports are starting to file in from the Western side of the state. Now that the general deer season's open over there. And it's, it's, it's extremely bleak. I've talked to one yeah. guy that actually saw, more than 10 deer you know mm -hmm. you know in like a week in like several days of hunting it's it's bleak but there was uh um there was a guy out of southwest wyoming that did uh turn it in campaign you turn in your general deer tag that you buy and you're entered into this drawing for i mean in the gear list was unbelievable his name's zach zachary key uh yeah this is the guy's name good dude Anyway, it the campaign looked like it went pretty well, and the number of people that just went, you know what, these deer need a break. I'm here's my here's my general deer tag. I'm not going to hunt deer this year, and they didn't do it because oh, there was a cool rifle in a giveaway, or there was a gear package given away. I mean that that's incentive, but just the idea that hunters are conservation, hunting is conservation, and hunters are the original conservationists. And the idea that we could help a species like mule deer mm -hmm. by doing something like that. It's, it's all kind of rooted in the same principle. It's just, yeah, cool. and, yeah, it's, it's very cool. And I think it doesn't take that many people to get on board with the idea to like, all of a sudden you're sitting at the bar, having a beer with a group of buddies that you usually hunt with. And it's like, Hey guys, like, let's go do something else that week. We typically go to deer camp or let's go do right. something else. You know, like whatever the species is, like we can find other activity yeah. to do if, if things need a break. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, you know, you can talk a lot about that on the Turkey side of things, you know, like yes. there's certain populations that, you know, could use a break. And so we need to, you know, like there's biologists and stuff at the state level do an amazing job, but they only have so many eyes and ears on the whole thing. Right. So they need to hear back from all of us that are out spending time in the field. And so they can ex extrapolate that data a little better. And we need to do a better job of talking to each other about it and be like, Hey, like it was rough. Like, you know, even, you know, like there's not as many, you know, counts and stuff, uh, like in the Dakotas as there typically is in the West, as far as winter kill goes, but man, it was bad this, this last year, like basically the entirety of both States just got wrecked. So, yeah. um, yeah, there, I think there's going to be, uh, we usually do a family, you know, kind of deer camp in November, but there, it might be a little bit of duck hunting and pheasant hunting, <laughs> a little bit more of that than it will be deer hunting. Which yeah, is fine. No. yeah, no, I, I like your point of view where there's always something else to do. You know, mm -hmm. there's always something else you can go do at that time of year. Hey, we could do, you know, maybe ice fishing in, in November at some place, or like you said, duck hunting or pheasant hunting or whatever it might be. You know, it, it's on us at the end of the day, it's on us to be responsible and, and be willing to sacrifice once yep. in a while. But yep. well, that's, tell me, tell us more about public land teas. You know, sure. that's, that's something that that's, that's kind of what you do if yep. I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. So Josh and I, my older brother, Josh, um, we started public land teas in 2017 and it was kind of, uh, launched at the exact same time that I had driven West in an old school bus converted into <laughs> hunting lodge. And you know, the, the bus was a billboard for public lands. It was a, it was a way to raise awareness about public land issues 
and uh, really educate people about what they could do to get involved, which is talk to your senators, talk to your representatives, uh, make sure that you are being heard about issues that are pro or anti hunting. And so the, the bus was the billboard, but we wanted a way to figure out how to fund these organizations that have people on the ground every day, whether it be in the, at the state level or the federal level, lobbying for hunters. And so we decided to start public land tees. And ever since we started five bucks from everything we've sold, we donate back to different initiatives, typically on the access side, because our whole goal is to increase access, you know, buy it more private land, turn into public, um, you know, raise dollars for campaigns where it creates more uh private land turned into public land access so whether it be walk in public or uh, plots you know the new path program in south dakota luck management in montana there's a million different names for it um but yeah the whole thing our whole company was founded as a way to raise money for conservation so yeah we've been doing that for um coming up on six years well over six years now and uh yeah, yeah it's been it's been really good you know between the Stamp It Forward project, and we did a big project called Conservation Crossing a couple of years ago where you could buy a shirt for 125 bucks and you became a member of five organizations. And we just tried to really, you know, kind of step away from the typical banquet idea and come up with our own versions of ways to raise money for conservation. It's been been fun. That's cool. And your designs on your shirts are just, they're killer. I mean, who <laughs> wouldn't want to wear one? You, you guys, where can people find this stuff? Yeah. So if you go to publiclandtees.com, uh, all of our inventory is on there. And then we have uh, several, several, at least two, but no, we got three new designs coming uh, that should post this week. We're just waiting on the, you know, the screens and the transfers and all that stuff to to hit so we can actually post them because I don't want people to get mad if the <laughs> have to wait a second for yeah. the, the shirts to roll in. But yeah, we got some cool stuff surrounding the waterfowl world coming in and, and uh, yeah, it's going to be going to be good. Oh, I love it. I love it, dude. Yeah. yeah, it's uh we just dropped um my microphone's sliding down here. Hold on. <laughs> there we go. That should work better. We just dropped the video or put the finishing touches on our sage grouse, our big sage grouse project video. Oh, sweet. And that's the entire impetus behind that video. And Ed, Ed, back to Ed. But um he he and actually he and I actually went and did a hunt and we couched the entire video started it kind of because you kind of you need some hunting footage you know because mm -hmm. that's that's what we talked about earlier about hunting is conservation but about the um the looming listing on the esa of this of the greater sage grouse and everything that that threatens those birds but threatens so much more than that um and public access being a huge thing one of the, it's, it was a big onion and we started peeling back layers and it was like talking to different people and stakeholders and was like, oh my gosh. And it became uh, startlingly apparent that if these birds get listed on the ESA, a lot of public ground is going to go bye-bye yep. because they're just going to close it down. And for a lot of different, you know, multiple uses, whether that be agriculture, whether that be oil production, energy industry, or just recreational use, which is most what most of the folks listening to this podcast are concerned with. Yeah, and those issues, and it's not just sage grouse. I mean, go watch the film. We're gonna we're gonna drop it. Obviously, it's it's gonna be a super cool deal. It is a really interesting film, but so big. The public land the public land issue is huge. Yeah, and I'm sure that you've kind of kind of realized some of that over the last few years as you've swam in that sea. Yeah, you know, I think it's interesting uh, for people to understand that the the sage grouse, you know, like you hear a lot about that, but uh, like I think what most people don't realize is that it's just the first domino, oh, man. right? And, so, and you know, and so if, when you start to understand that all of it is connected, you know, like you said, it's not just sage grouse, it's access and it's everything else that relies on, on sagebrush for their habitat, you know, like, um, yeah, so it's it's um it's very important for all of us to be protecting those things so you don't have to you don't tip that first domino which leads to decreased access, decreased, you know, populations, decreased tags, decreased opportunity. Um, you know, it's up to all of us to to kind of keep a finger on the pulse. And so like if there is, 
you know, bills that are going to be passed for funding. Um, if there's, you know, fundraisers that we need to be a part of, all of those things we need to be, everybody needs to be jumping on that so we don't lose all that access because decreased access leads to decreased um, quality of experience. And that leads to a decrease in the number of hunters in general, which leads to a decrease um, like power in the voice of hunters, which leads to a decrease in our ability to get things passed or denied within the legislature that lead to all of the things I just said. So it's just this big cycle. Yes. Um, yeah. So we need to, we need to stay on top of it. Oh man. Yeah. It's, it's eye opening. And when you start looking at the big, big picture, it's like, holy smokes. But yeah, being active and being, being involved and going and buying a t-shirt, you know, so that five bucks goes to the right place that so little things like that add up. Yeah. Yep. Big, big time. Yep. Well, that's, that is, you know, that's the kind of the nitty gritty of what you've been doing. Yes. <laughs> but to, you know, there, there might be some folks out here that, that don't know the name. They don't know who Sam Sohold is. Who are you, man? How did you get started in all of this? Where did you come from? What's, what's the background history? Where did I come from? Where did I go? Uh, yeah, I love it. <laughs> so the, my background, um, I, you know, grew up in the Dakotas. So I was born in Aberdeen, South Dakota, you know, when I was super great young. Town. We, great yeah, town. Great, it is. It is a great town. And when I was pretty young, we moved to Sioux Falls. And so I was basically raised in Sioux Falls. And, uh, you know, somewhere along my 10th year of life, we started duck hunting and like went all in. And it was, you know, to the point where my dad is a bit of a hoarder in general, um, <laughs> when it comes to hunting gear, not everything, but just hunting gear. Sure. And so, and so, you know, like, and it was like, it's funny you think back on it. It's like right around the time eBay came out, right around the oh, time man. Craigslist came out. So, you know, he was bidding on duck calls and we were Craigslist and, and, uh, yard sale and decoys and, you know, he was buying boats in Wisconsin and picking them up when he went to go visit his dad and mom, you know, it was just like, it was all encompassing. And like, by the time, you know, my older brother graduated high school, we had amassed like 30 dozen floating mallards and th like 13 duck boats. I mean, all, you know, like we had, you know, one big duck boat with the blind and then a pile of little ones that we could use uh -huh. and, you know, small sloughs and so many, you know, just all this stuff, you know, and, uh, went really hard on it. So, I actually chose, you know, my older brother chose college so he could go learn how to elk hunt. So he went to University of Wyoming and I chose college at North Dakota State so I could uh, have close proximity to good waterfowling. And I got state reciprocity for licenses so I could hunt South Dakota and North Dakota Nice <laughs> for, for ducks and geese for uh, another five years. Um, and, and that really led to like my whole you know, kind of like being that immersed into the outdoors and growing up with a, you know, dad and brother and uncles and grandpas and stuff that did it all, you know, both Josh and I became, you know, fairly fanatical about it all. And, you know, to the point where he opened up and backcountry hunting gear at archery pro shop in Colorado. And I got an internship with Midwest whitetail and went down and to Southern Iowa and learned video production and pro staff management and telling a story and all that stuff. And both of us have kind of been you know, going down this road of like, you just, how deep in it can we get, you know? And, and it turns out you can get very, very deep into the hunting industry and to the point now where we're, you know, have a bunch of brands that we work with in, in the space for content creation. So photography, video, uh, ambassador style roles, and then public land tees is, you know, kind of our way to be really buried into the conservation space. So, you know, end up at, events like pheasants for, you know, pheasant fest for pheasants forever. And we've been to the total archery challenges and, you know, I really want to make it the sheep show this year. We've got a few ideas to work with the wild sheep foundation. So, you know, it's, it, um, uh, yeah. So I, I grew up in the Dakotas and then have been snowballing every opportunity into the next opportunity and have been just, you know, it's, it's fun to, uh, it's so fun to be a part of all of it, but every once in a while I got to step back and be like, all right, how, like, from the outside looking in, what am I actually doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because, yeah. because, like, it's really, you know, like, you get, like, I'm sure you see it too. Like, you know, like, we hear a lot of the stuff that happens in the industry or stuff that's happening with conservation bills and all that stuff. But, like, for the general public, it is really hard to kind of wade through all of the information that is yeah. constantly hitting the social stream. So, a lot of times I have to think back, like, 
you know, think outside and just say, all right, let's slow this down a little bit. Let's really break this down. Let's educate people again. And then we can go, you know, move forward, especially with how the algorithms work now and uh, how big of a pain it is to actually have anybody see anything you post, which is, it is, <laughs> yeah. it is. I, yep. I, I get, I get, I'd say probably 95% of what you do. I see it, yep. but there's times when it comes and goes too. Oh yeah. You know, it's, it's weird. I hadn't seen anything you had done on Instagram, for example, in a couple months. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden there's the duck rock. Right. Yep. And it's, it was uh, just constant. And I'm like, share the story, share the story, share the yeah. story. You know, it's like, <laughs> just, it's like, man, just, because I feel like we need to be sharing each other's, if each other's messages too, to help build that awareness. So people hear it. Like you said, otherwise it gets lost, it gets buried. And the next yep. thing you know, it's like, well, yeah, I did all, I, I put, I hiked 33 miles a day and nobody <laughs> knew. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, it, it was, uh, it, it was interesting, you know, like I'm, we're giving a bunch of gear away and everything, but like the fact that, you know, DU was willing to help, you know, yeah. share it big time and have me on the podcast and Delta was willing to share it big time and get, you know, and that really helped put a ton of eyeballs on this whole thing. You know, but at the end of the day, like, you know, we're sitting at like 460 donations or something like that, you know, going into this, like we, we really lowered the barrier to entry for people to get involved. Um, and so, you know, as little as 10 cents a mile, you can go yeah, and donate. So yeah, 10 yeah. bucks, um, you know, so it was, you know, kind of an interest, interesting, like kind of experiment on this, like, okay, what, uh, you know, I'm out there trying to earn donations and I got to do this really cool project and got to you know, beat myself down for a hundred miles. Um, but I think what it did is it put tons, I mean, you know, like on my account alone, it saw, it showed that I had reached 216,000 individual accounts over the last seven days. That's awesome. And so, and so just like through that major sharing of, you know, all of the different organizations and everything in the industry, I think it was above and beyond what we raised, you know, as far as donations, I think the impact that that's going to have on the number of people who actually understand what the hell a duck stamp is, mm -hmm. you know, is, is a win is a giant win. So yeah. maybe next year, you know, they go buy two, you know, or, you know, exactly. it's uh yeah. So it's, it, it's, yeah, it's been fun. Well, back to you learning how to be a videographer and all that stuff back when you were younger. Yep. Um, that's how you and I have the connection yep. because very early on you did a hunt with our own Brandon Mason. I did indeed. Stories from that <laughs> hunt. He's you know, brand. I don't know where, how old Brandon was at that time, but you're, you're quite a bit younger than him. Yeah. Brandon and I are roughly the same age. I think we're a year apart, but he's like hiking up. Apparently it was this grueling death march of a deer hunt in Colorado <laughs> And he's like the whole time I'm hiking up these hills going, stay in front, stay in front. Don't let this young guy catch you. Don't, he said, don't, don't, that don't act like a wuss. And he's like, I was dying the entire time. <laughs> well, come to find out. <laughs> oh yeah. He wasn't the only one dying. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. That was, that was, that's, that story is, is phenomenal. And there's something to do with a plastic egg crate. Yeah. I actually brought it with me. Not the Look one, at not, that. Oh, not the one, but yeah, we, uh, you know, we, <laughs> when you go through a really both mentally and physically difficult hunt with somebody else, I think you just like, you, you know, you experience all that together. And so we ended up having lots of, you know, kind of funny stories coming out of that hunt all the way from, you know, like we were talking about like the amount of gear that you amass, you know, like in the, in the camping world. And, you know, one of the jokes was these plastic egg crates that you know like you go through like the camping section at uh yeah. whatever you know bass pro or cabela's or shields or whatever you know there's always like the oh, who makes it like McCall mclaughlin or McLaughlin, something like yeah that. And, and it's like <laughs> they make every small thing oh. that exists for camping and so yeah the joke was you know well it gonna end up with one of those like dozen egg crate ho holders for, for the cooler so we don't you know don't have soggy egg cartons but yeah. I had, I had this summer. I wish I'd have had one of those. Mm -hmm. I do have one, but at the last minute for the family, big camping trip this summer, I forgot to put my eggs in it. Yep. So I just put them on top in the Yeti. You know, I was like, okay, they're, they're, they're okay. Well, we're bouncing down this horrible, horrible road. 
And I thought I had my cooler strapped down, but I look in the <laughs> rear view mirror and my Yeti's tumbling end over end down the hill behind the truck. And I went, great. So I got to the top, parked the truck. Wife and I went back down, picked it up. I was like, I'm not even going to open it. I don't want to, I don't want to know. And I got sure enough, got to camp, started getting stuff around and my, all of my eggs for the entire week were Just smashed, smashed. <laughs> smashed. Everything else in the cooler was fine, but, yep. and yep. the Yeti was no worse for wear, but good grief, dude. I was just like, should have had a plastic egg crate. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, no, we, yeah. It, you know, it's funny how many stories came from that hunt. Cause like, you know, it was early in my career. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, like we, I think we hunted like seven or eight days or whatever it was, had gone up for three and a half and came back down and then went back up. But man, it was, yeah, it was like 3,500 vertical and a mile and a half or whatever to get to like up to this ridge. Brutal. And, Brutal. And, and then we didn't see a deer like at all. Not like, I mean, we none <laughs> on day like six or seven or whatever it was. I'm sure Brandon told you, like, I thought I was like, give me this spotter. You know, I thought I had glassed up this deer like a long way away and i just caught just a little bit of movement going down this trail and he gets me the spotter and i get on it and i had glassed a porcupine at three miles away so it, we weren't missing deer like we yeah like, exactly just, you know if like they just oh, didn't dude. exist <laughs> that's rough that is rough yeah when you're when you're picking out quill pigs at three miles right you're yeah. you're on it you're yeah. on it oh yeah. man <laughs> so when is speaking of stories and connections when can we expect the coffee table book to come out? You know, I feel like I need to keep gathering content on that one. <laughs> so that, oh. that whole story, that's that idea stemmed from at the time when I was filming for Brandon, like, like all I was doing was backcountry hunts. I mean, I was right. spending like 75 to 125 days a year in a tent or you know in a tent or a wall tent or somewhere in the back country just like you right. know live living back there and so i had i'd come up with this idea to have a coffee table book called pooping in beautiful places if <laughs> a backcountry photographer's story and it was just going to be like a photo essay of like all these cool you know locations that i've been but obviously right, right. You know, there, there would be like the every story would start with a photo from some location that I right, had right. to drop one. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. When, when I heard about that, I instantly thought back to my days living on Kodiak Island and yep. the outhouse, the view out of the outhouse was unbelievable. And yep. you never knew when a, when a brown bear was going to come waltzing by either, you know, but <laughs> it was like, Holy smoke. So that, I think that, I think that coffee table book would resonate with an awful lot of people. Yeah. I really, I, might, I really do. You know, I've, I've been still doing a lot of trips, obviously. So I might have to like just organize that that book at some point. You know, maybe yeah. that'll be like my mic drop on the industry whenever I decide to, you know, do something else. <laughs> I'm retiring. Here you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> here's my here's my gift. Yes. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. Oh man. So it's September. We've got some seasons open. What yep. have you been hunting? Uh, so the first week of September, I went up and tried to kill a velvet uh, whitetail in North okay. Dakota. Uh, I knew I had that duck rut coming up, so I didn't want to go um, too far off the grid um, just in case, you know, something happened. And, and so went up there and unsuccessful, you know, didn't fill a tag yet, but I still have my North yeah. Dakota tag. So plenty of time. And then uh, this uh, kind of knew i was going to need a little bit of a breather so this next week and a half or so is just going to be prep work for the rest of the year so getting more cameras out and and doing a bunch of stuff and then um early october josh and i are going to get together and chase uh mule deer with the bow and then mid-october i'm filming him on a rifle elk hunt in colorado and then we both have mule deer tags uh, for rifles right at the end of october and then we we have a couple archery whitetail hunts in November. So it'll be a very busy, uh, like basically starting the last day of September through Thanksgiving is going to be a whirlwind for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. You're, you're kind of in the, on the same program that we are out here with me. I, for me personally, I don't have anything going on in September. So I've been chasing mountain grouse with my, with my eight year old trying to yep. get her, trying to get her in the game. Sweet. Yeah. It's been fun. It's been fun. She was actually successful the first trip out so oh, that was good that, yeah it was pretty cool yeah um trying to get her hooked you know build that hunter recruitment picture that next generation yep but yeah it sounds kind of like you're on the same roughly the program we don't we don't get crazy serious about uh ducks especially until november 
yeah pretty yeah. much the end of november december january and then into february of course but and i don't other than sage grouse which is open right now um i'm planning on going out this weekend and chasing some of that but yeah man you're you do the same thing it's a big game for the early part of the fall and then it's birds yep so yeah so and then uh my wife is doing travel occupational therapy and so we'll see where her next rotation takes her, which I always just follow her around and then work off of that. So um, fingers crossed for somewhere warm for the winter. That would be nice. <laughs> yeah. That would be yeah. nice. I would not mind getting south, you know, if it's Arizona or New Mexico or somewhere, like somewhere I can get close enough to go chase coos deer in oh, January yeah. or javelina oh, yeah. or whatever. You know, there's, oh, there's, yeah. there's always tags somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, between tags and then so many of those places come with some upland opportunity or something yep. mixed in the mix. You know, I think about Arizona and I am that is the that is the teeth of my waterfowl season and production and content production time. So I don't stray very far from Wyoming and Montana that time of year. But yep. man, I have a hankering to go down there and chase quail yep. in in the desert. And it is so much fun. Uh, Randy Newberg used to throw a, a camp every year for a coos deer, but we'd go down and hang out with the guys from uh, Arizona Game and Fish, and a couple of them were absolute bird hounds. And so, we, you know, we would go and, and chase quail, and you can go shoot three of the four major quail species down there. So you can shoot merns and gambrels and, oh, I'm drawing a blank now. Scaled? Scaled, yeah, scalies. Yep, and so, I mean, it's just amazing and you know or you can go jump shoot you know stock tanks for ducks yeah and you get yeah. you know you, there's or we shot uh antelope jackrabbits so like the small game thing in arizona is so much fun right I mean, it's it's beautiful it's way more beautiful than you would think as far as like desert landscape goes and you just get out and there's these jackrabbits that are like 13 pounds and the back straps and <laughs> i mean the, the back like you get tons of meat off of them and it all tastes pretty dang good and that's awesome uh, yeah it's i don't know it's the the whole experience down there is is very cool so uh, yeah, i've always back. i've always had and i can credit my dad to this um this this dream of kind of following the woodcock flight yeah south yeah. you know starting in Maybe start in Canada. The problem yep. is in, in Canada, seasons start about the same time as like Michigan and Minnesota's and Wisconsin's do too. But maybe start up there on the Northeast and then just work your way all the way down mm -hmm. to that would be you know, super Alabama, cool. Louisiana. That would be fun, man. Yeah, it's kind yeah. of a niche. I mean, woodcock hunters were all a little crazy, but well, yeah. I, haven't, I haven't shot a woodcock in years. But <laughs> oh man, yeah, that kind of stuff is just there's so much opportunity out there if you're. Uh, you know, obviously big games, a ton of fun and it pays the bills, you know, largely for what we do, but man, my heart is put a, put a renegade in my hand and, you know, give me a box of federals and I'm a happy guy, you yeah. know, especially yeah. if I got a dog to chase hundred percent yeah. and growing yeah. up in Aberdeen, dude, I mean, talk about pheasants. Holy smokes. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, yeah, it, that, yeah, the pheasant thing is awesome. And I, I'm trying to get out with some guys this year to do a lot more of that. Um, just, you know, I just, I love upland hunting. I love waterfowl hunting. I love the big game side, but just trying to have be do more balanced of it all. Cause I think it just makes you a better hunter, like in every aspect, if you actually do all of it instead of specializing in one. So, man, you hit the nail on the head with that. I had, um, my brother came out last year. We hadn't hunted together like seriously hunted together in 15 years. He's in Northeast Iowa and, you know, I'm out here in Northwest Wyoming. So it's like we could see each other maybe once a year. Mm -hmm. And once in a while, if I can draw like a late muzzleloader tag for Iowa, I'll go back and hunt with him. But otherwise we just don't get to hunt together. So right. I talked him into coming out. That's just my dad talked him into coming out last year to hunt ducks in, I think it was December. It might've been January. Anyway, late. And he's like, I, I, that sounds good, but I I want to shoot a pintail. You know, growing up in Michigan, we didn't we didn't get tracks of pintails hardly yep. ever. We just didn't see them, and so it was kind of everybody's dream from back there. And I was like, well, <laughs> okay, <laughs> so we don't have a lot of them, but there's <laughs> there's some around, you know. Yep. Well, it turns out he ends up shooting this pintail, this big Drake pintail. First morning, we're uh, second morning, we're out, and it wasn't in a group of birds. It was decoying. It was you know. It's legal shooting light, but it's that typical, everything's flying around and it's chaos, big groups of birds. And we were just kind of letting that settle down and just sit back and drink coffee and enjoy the show. And, and, uh, then shoot your singles or your doubles, you know, as yep. they in later in the morning. Well, 
this pintail, he picks out this drake pintail in a group of, I don't know, 10 or 15 mallards that are, they're in range. I mean, they're like 40 yards up, but they're not decoying. They're just buzzing down the river. Right. And shoots it and kills it. But I didn't see it hit the water. No, and my dogs didn't mark it. And it's fast. You know, these Western yep. rivers, it's, it's, if you don't get on it, it's gone. Right. And I'm, I'm thinking it fell on the other bank. Cause I got, we got out pretty quick, started looking and it is nowhere to be seen. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it's gotta be on the other bank. So I've got both dogs over hunting the grass on the opposite side, up and down, up and down, up and down. And my brother just takes off down river. Yep. And he finds that Drake pintail washed up in a log jam half a mile down river <laughs> you know and it goes back into being a hunter and yep. having those skill sets and know it being able to look at a situation and having all the experience from big game hunts and small game hunts and all this stuff and just knowing what happens on these things and he was able to be like you know what this bird's this current's fast it's way further down than i think it probably is right he just took off and yep. he found it and yep. there it was dead, dead as a doornail, yep. but it was, it wasn't anywhere where we would have found it, you know? Well, yeah. It's just being able to put all those pieces together in your head and, and think, you know, think that next step, think beyond. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's awesome. I mean, what a, what a story of staying with it and just figuring it out. <laughs> it was, it was cool, but I think it just illustrates, you know, your point that you made about, you know, being a hunter and hunting a lot of different things, you know, and everybody's got their thing that they love, you know, yep. this this time of year it's killing me i'm not bow hunting elk this year mm -hmm. and i drew a late season elk tag like december late bull, yeah. uh, bull, bull tag and it it's open to archery elk but it's a it's an off national forest tag which in the area i drew means pretty much private land sure. and the elk really scattered and spread out this time of year yeah it just makes sense to just wait and hunt them when they bunch up and they're in there and later in the year when it gets cold, but it's killing me, dude. I, I mean, <laughs> I haven't been in the woods. Brandon's Brandon's son drew a really good elk tag here close to home. And I'm like, you know, Hey, can, can I tag along? Can I call? Can I help pack? Can I, you know, he's like, I'm just dying to get out there and do that. Cause, yeah. cause I, I love it. And I think we all have those things that we're just super passionate about, mm -hmm. you know, some guys it's whitetails, but what's, what's yours? What's your like number one? You know, I can I generalize and just say deer. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. what I mean, whether it's spot and stock mule deer or whitetails, I I don't care. I just love deer hunting. Um, and a lot of people make fun of me that it's not elk. I mean, because I've done a lot of elk hunting and I've killed a couple good elk and like you know, and it by if, by all means that should be my favorite. But I I think I think it stemmed from the time at Midwest whitetail where it was like three mm. months of all you do is talk about live, breathe whitetail hunting. And I think that just got under my skin and I, I just, I love the puzzle. So, um, but yeah, and then mule deer, like I inherited that from my brother and his business partner, buddy, um, they are ate up with big spot and stock mule deer hunting. And so any, any chance I can get to do that, I, I just love it, which I should be out there probably right now doing that. But, uh, <laughs> After that, after that hike, my feet needed a couple of days. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. The, that the backcountry thing is at 45 years old, I'm good for one or two a year anymore. Yep. And I'm like, I need a break. Yep. I need a break. Oh, we're going to road hunt a late season rut tag. Yeah, I'm down. Yes. You know, <laughs> sign me up. <laughs> I'm going to glass from the truck before I stalk. Yeah, I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It sounds terrible. And a, and a 25 year old me would be rolling over right now, but. Oh man. Yeah, dude. It's everybody's got their thing and it, mm -hmm. it's cool that yours is deer. You know, I think I talked to so many guys that it's turkeys. It's in it, in it, it's turkeys. I love hunting turkeys, but, and I'm sure I know you do too, mm -hmm. but when it's turkey season, it's turkey season. And I'm not the guy that thinks about it 24 seven. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I'm a turkey fanatic when it's turkey season. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah it's, just crazy, but uh, yeah, everybody's got their thing. You know, I know guys that are that are just bird hunting machines. You know, you talk about back to the Arizona thing, uh, Rooster Levens. I don't know if you know who that is. Out of you know, Stonefly, the Stonefly Inn and Outfitters out of Twin Bridges, Montana. Okay, and you'd think, I mean, he's a celebrity in the world of fly fishing, 
And you'd think that's, you know, that's this guy's thing. But what he's really ate up with is bird dogs and upland birds. Yeah. And he's a guy that this time of year, starting about now, when the trout see his guide season kind of wind, is winding down, he's kenneling up, I don't know how many dogs. And he's all over Montana, all over Idaho. He's all over the place. And he ends up every year down on the border in Arizona. Yep. You know, with six dogs in a trailer eating quail tacos every night, you know, right. and it's like, <laughs> That stuff's cool. And I, my yeah. hat's off to those guys that are like, that's my thing. And that's all I want to do. Right. Yeah. yeah. Cause it's, it's good to have a thing, you know, I thought 100%. I like that. Yeah. And yeah. You got to have something that fuels you, you know, yeah. otherwise, you know, I was grousing around the house the other day. It's hunting season and I'm not hunting. And my wife's <laughs> like, oh, I love September. It's like this every year, you know, <laughs> and as, as much fun as social media is and is as good of a tool as it is, to you know spread the word about conservation and get people involved man it can be frustrating because you it's so easy to forget that what you're seeing in posts is a snippet oh yeah of somebody's life yeah you no know, you're like i want to do that mm -hmm. yeah it is just a highlight reel <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah you know the, the old saying comparison is the thief of joy mm -hmm. you know and the, i think you got to remember that stuff this time of year yeah. big time yeah, the Big whole time. fall, man, especially, oh, yeah, like, it, it's, it doesn't matter what season there's, all, like, you know, whether it's you're following, you know, guys that are hunting and then it, the migration hits and all of a sudden everybody's stacking mallards and pintails and whatever, or it's the deer rut and November 7th hits and then the entire feed is full of, you know, big rutted up bucks. Or it's, you know, or it's mid, you know, third weekend in September, third week in September, and then all of a sudden everybody had got their bull, you know. I know. <laughs> it's just, it doesn't. It's going to happen. You know, it's going to happen. Yeah. The algorithm's going to feed it to you. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh man. I, I had to, I learned that lesson the hard way when I was teaching and I, my, one of my, one of my first teaching gigs out here in Wyoming, one of the veteran teachers was like, so you gotta, you gotta think about, you gotta realize something. And these kids are bringing in stories, their dads out killing elk and all this stuff. And you're in a classroom teaching and you're doing this and you're coaching football and you're doing all these other things that these guys have worked all year long. You know, a lot of them own their own businesses or they're yep. construction guys or whatever. They're like, they work all year long and they take that two weeks vacation in September. And that's it. And that's it. Yep. And then they're back to doing that. And you get to do it here and there and spread it out, you know, over time. Yeah. And just keeping that in mind about, you know, just, just do you, you yeah. know, and take enjoyment where you can get enjoyment because, you know, when you did the public land bus, I followed that so closely yeah, because that struck a chord with me that harkened back to the old Northwoods deer camps that I grew up in Yep, and my grandpa's stories of retrofitting an old, I don't know, something from the 50s school bus after world, well, might have been older than that because this was after World War II. And they did the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, dude, I was like, just watching everything you did going, that is so <laughs> cool. I would love to be doing that. That's awesome. How yeah. did you get the idea for that? Uh, so the bus idea stemmed uh, from my older brother, actually. So it, um, since he, so he owned a Gannett Ridge, uh, which has since closed down. They're running botoonschool.com, which is an online archery technician course. So if anybody wants to learn how to, work on their own bow from top to bottom, left to right, tear it apart, put it back together, all that stuff. Um, there's a course called Botoon School that they created and it's a way and you can actually get a archery technician certificate. So if you're trying to go work at an archery shop, like you can get certified for that. Oh, that's um, awesome. But before that, so they, they own Gannett Ridge, which is in Fort Collins. And it was, oh, maybe, you know, we could use a school bus as like a, a marketing, um, you know, vehicle for the shop. It can park out front and then, you know, even turn it into like a mobile archery shop and run it up to Laramie once a week and work on people's bows. Cause at the time the archery shop in Laramie had closed and, you know, they thought maybe, okay, we could, you know, bounce around and, and work on people's bows and, That's and all a great that great idea. There's so yeah. much, you live in a rural community, especially in the West, it can be hard to find somebody to work on your bow, somebody that you yeah. trust, right. you know? Right. So it kind of, kind of started there and then it was like, oh, you know what we could use it for, um, I'm trying to think of what the, I mean, just some other ideas of like what you could use it for around town. And then, you know, kind of the final idea on it was, you know, 
it's got pretty high center of grab or pretty high like clearance you know and lots of room you know rip all the seats out throw some bunk beds in there and you can go turkey hunt like 12 states you know but um and so the idea of like turning a bus into a hunting lodge like kind of just like kept eating at my brain um for a few years and so every time you see a school bus i'd be you know in my head i was like oh that's a good one you know that's like and uh you know, so you just keep thinking about it and then the end of 2016 the, the the biggest thing i couldn't figure out was okay you know like the career that i wanted was to be spending time outdoors shooting photos video doing all that stuff and simply building out a school bus into a hunting rig is cool but it there's no real lasting you yeah. know effect on that there's not like what's the why um and i was actually driving um josh and i had both started looking for buses on craigslist because i was going to buy one but i was still trying to figure out like okay what's the story that needs to be told and, and what's the not the angle but what's like the what's the greater mission behind the bus and i was driving one day and i was like you know it was the time in the like in 2016 there was a big push to transfer uh federally managed lands to the states which yes. is a very pretty way to market states rights um but it basically leads to privatization of public lands and so i called josh and i was like what if we use the bus to basically promote public lands raise awareness about what people are actually trying to do try to protect public lands and have it be basically a billboard for this much larger purpose than just you know having a cool bus to go hunt out of right and and that was it that was like it's like okay now there's a mission and josh ended up finding the bus on craigslist in colorado and new year's eve 2016 i bought the bought the school bus for 3500 bucks and then <laughs> and then the summer it did most of the build um the summer of 2017 and then drove west and you know basically lived in it for two and a half years and then since then we you know we did the bus and did that whole project and then got a van and did four-wheel drive van and built mm -hmm. that whole thing out and you know there's just we like building stuff um so there's more projects in the works here and and uh we'll see see when josh wants to talk about that one but he's got he's got another big idea so oh i love it i love <laughs> yeah. it can't wait i yeah. can't wait to see what you guys come up with next yeah. that's that's yeah. been fun to, been fun to watch yeah how is it to keep that old bus running you know the uh, knock on wood the bus has been good now i will say that i over service uh any vehicle build that i've done that yeah. we've done um like the bus i i tend to change oil and have it checked more often than I probably need to. Um, but there's only one of those. And so if that breaks down, like that's, that's it. Um, you know, and someday I probably need to, you know, in the not too distant future, I probably need to figure out a way to get rid of the bus and raise a bunch of money for conservation sure. or do something with it that, you know, kind of pass that public land bus torch to somebody else. And whether it gets used for the same mission or not, like, you know, just having it be kind of finish out under the original pretenses that it was built under to uh kind of make a big stamp on something in the conservation world i think that probably need to do something with it yeah you know even if you auction it off and with a portion of those monies going to you know conservation different organizations right. or whatever right and the person that buys it could do whatever they want with it you exactly know? Yeah. but yeah it's just a cool it's just a cool deal and man i just never forget seeing you watching you just do that and i was just like dude because i <laughs> I hunted out of an old bus, you know, and yep. I've, I've been around them where that was a thing, you know, and it's yeah. like, oh, yeah, it's middle of October, better get the bus fired up and go, yep. you know, figure out where we're going to park it this year, you know, <laughs> yeah, it was, it, it, it was cool. It was cool. And, and yep. just the, having the grand division to be able to pull something like that off is kudos, man. That's, yep. that's just super awesome. But, yeah. And it's still fun every time I fire it up and take it to deer camp i mean i i drove the bus to uh north dakota deer camp this year and we had you know four or five people sleeping in the bus and we had the big tent set up and it was just you know it's it's uh yeah it's a very cool rig and uh, to be able to have shared experiences with i have no idea how many people now have slept in that thing but it's been it's been really fun oh it's cool you know and, and it goes back into you know the stories and the culture and the tradition of what ties us all together you know we hunting is hunting is such a broad spectrum of ideas and uh you know pursuits and methodology but when you get right down to it we're a we're a family of people with a shared passion yep and whether it's you know whether your thing is 
pheasants or doves or early teal or ducks or I don't turkeys, whatever it might be, or you get into the big game side of things, being able to share those stories and tell those stories. I mean, human beings have been doing that for eons, you mm-hmm. know, getting together and telling hunting stories around a campfire someplace. Yeah, it's just anything we can do to continue that just builds, you know, keeps stoking that fire. That's right. That's yep, that's cool. exactly right. That is super cool, man. But yeah, so you've got some, you've got a bunch of big game hunts on the docket. Do you have any plans, like waterfall plans, you going anywhere, or is it just like take it as it comes? Yep, uh, I got some plans on the waterfall side. Um, some I can't share yet, okay, um, just because it's a part of another project. Yeah, no, that's fair. <laughs> that, but uh, I get but, that. Yeah, but it, honestly, just trying to fill all the gaps with with waterfall hunts and and uh, I supposed to fly to seattle well not supposed to flying to seattle on saturday evening but duck season opens in north dakota this saturday uh i don't know if i'll be able to get out or not um before we take off and fly out and do a little trip but um but yeah i'm my my kind of whole plan is anytime i'm not um you know on a specific trip for big game i'll probably be trying to go out and kill some kill some ducks because the oh, the God. the hatch this year was phenomenal so the early season stuff especially in north dakota should be very good that's good to hear yeah, yeah. i didn't i didn't get a chance to go to go through that country at all this year mm-hmm. i've been in literally in wyoming all summer long but my wife went through south dakota took the kids back to visit relatives in iowa this summer and she said you know she kind of she's kind of tuned into the little bit of that stuff now and yep she didn't she didn't, I didn't even bring it up. She was just like, man, we saw so every little piece of water had ducks on it. Mm-hmm. I, that's cool. That's yep. awesome. That's good to hear because I don't know what you guys have seen back there. Our numbers look, have looked great because we winter a lot of birds here, but man, with those large numbers of birds, especially on the, on the goose front, we've taken a massive hit on with avian flu the last yeah. two years. Yep. I mean, I'm, at least one or two birds every hunt we would you know especially when it came to geese they just come in a couple of them would come into the decoys usually by themselves it's like they're barely hanging in the air yeah you know they can barely fly yeah and it's like just shoot that bird and we'll you know throw it over here and we'll keep that one separate from the pile yeah and you know you'd you'd go out and scout and invariably there after a group would leave a field there'd be a dead one out there or two yeah or three so it's good to hear that those numbers there's a good hatch and then we've got good birds you know i talked to i talked to my buddies in northern alberta and they said the same thing they said man we have the flights this year have been phenomenal so far yeah lots and lots of birds yeah i did the the counts just came out not too long ago in north dakota for brood brood numbers and it was uh, it was very high compared to the last few years you know and, and that stemmed from massive drought and then we had right. a bad lots of snow last winter and then lots of rain this spring so we actually had enough water and all that you know all the sheet water sloughs and all the small potholes and stuff to actually raise birds so um, yeah, yeah and and you know wet spots grew tall grass because you couldn't get in to them and yep. yeah that's it, it all benefits it so yep. that's that's perfect yep super cool well yep. if you get out this way or get a hankering to get out this way man give us a shout Definitely. I've got a, I'll have a spot in a duck blind for you. Absolutely. We're going to have to make that happen. Josh yeah. and I can come up and come uh, share some more stories. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure that the guys wouldn't let a visit from Sam Soho go by without story time. <laughs> <laughs> well, dude, I really appreciate you taking your time and, and sitting down and, and talking about who you are and what you do and man, keep up the good work. You're, you're a hell of an ambassador for the sport and for, for all of us. So, keep driving man i love it absolutely well thanks for having me on and uh we'll have to do it again post season we can let's do talk, a wrap up talk, yeah talk about all the battle wounds we'll, yep. we'll give a uh, everyone who's listening an update on the amount of money we raised um in total at the end of this year so absolutely. Um, yeah yeah I love absolutely. it well i've got to ask this final question yeah if you could only hunt one bird one way what's it going to be uh, mallards over water that's yep. a tough that's that's an easy response i yep. love it yeah man I it's, love it. it's what i grew up doing it's what i love watching and uh yeah if, if i had to pick seeing one thing every day for the rest of my life or only one you know hunting one bird that'd be definitely it i'm there with you i'm there with you that's there that's my thing too it's yep. like i don't care where mallards and over water i'm in yeah care where or how yep. so cool yep. 
Well, thank you, sir. I really appreciate it. And we'll be in touch. Good luck the rest of the fall. Yeah, it sounds good. You too.